Hello and welcome to this UCL summer school video on carbon capture and storage technology through chemical engineering. Presenting this video will be myself, Dr. Richard Porter and Dr. Eleanor Catalanotti. We are both researchers at UCL's Department of Chemical Engineering. This video has been produced in the context of the European Commission funded project called C4U that aims to reduce industrial emissions by developing carbon capture and storage technologies. Climate change is the greatest threat of the 21st century. Fossil fuels comprising coal, oil and natural gas provide most of today's energy needs. Yet as most of you will already know, greenhouse gases are emitted into the atmosphere when we burn fossil fuels, with the main contributor to our changing climate out of these gases being carbon dioxide or CO2. This is not just a challenge for future generations, the impacts of climate change are already being felt today in terms of increased frequency of extreme weather events, increased droughts and wildfires, decreasing agricultural yields and biodiversity loss. Developing the solutions to climate change is a complex challenge that chemical engineers will play a key role in. Let's first take a look at the breakdown of global fossil fuel CO2 emissions by sector. Out of 35 gigatons of CO2 emitted from fossil fuel combustion in 2018, 42% arose from electricity generation using fossil fuel power plants, while 9% arose from heating buildings. Another 25% of the CO2 emissions were produced by using fossil fuels to power different forms of transport. Energy intensive manufacturing industries also accounted for a large 24% share of fossil fuel CO2 emissions with industrial sectors of iron and steel, cement, chemicals and petrochemicals, aluminium, pulp, along with other industries, all contributing to these emissions. There is an urgent need to take action to reduce these emissions and mitigate climate change. Here is a very interesting and useful graph which shows the total greenhouse gas emissions and global warming scenarios under different climate policies. The y-axis shows the total greenhouse gas emissions from all of the different sources in gigatons of CO2 equivalent released per year. The x-axis shows how that amount of released greenhouse gases changes every decade, starting from the year 1990 and going up to 2100. We have five colored bands which represent different climate policy environments. The pink band represents the range of potential future greenhouse gas emissions. If we do nothing about them, the humankind carries on how it has been doing. And you can see that in the next decades, greenhouse gas emissions will rise rapidly. If we were to continue on this path, we would arrive at a global average temperature by year 2100, that would be 4.1 to 4.8 degrees C above pre-industrial levels. The yellow and orange bands represent future emission scenarios if the current policies, pledges and targets are adhered to by different countries around the world. By the end of the century, this would result in warming above pre-industrial levels of somewhere between 2.5 and 3.2 degrees C, which would still represent a dangerous level of climate change. In order to limit global warming to 1.5 or 2 degrees C, much more aggressive climate policies will need to be implemented, resulting in emissions pathways as represented by the turquoise and purple bands. For the two degrees warming pathway, close to net zero emissions will need to be achieved by the end of the century. While for the 1.5 degrees warming scenario, net negative emissions will need to be needed by the latter half of the century. To achieve such aggressive emissions reduction targets, a range of actions and technologies Will need to be developed and deployed. One of the key technologies for achieving emissions reduction is carbon capture and storage. Carbon capture and storage is very often abbreviated to CCS and can be defined as a collection of technologies that capture the CO2 emitted by fossil fuel power plants and other industrial processes and stores it in underground geological formations. Three distinct phases are needed to achieve the overall process. These are the capture of CO2 from the industrial process, the transport of pressurized CO2 to a geological storage site, 
and the injection of pressurized CO2 deep underground into a geological formation. All three of these phases have been practiced individually for different purposes, purposes for many decades, but it's only recently that they've been joined together and demonstrated in a real world full chain. First, CO2 must be captured by producing a nearly pure carbon dioxide stream, which often involves separating it from the mixture of gases produced by burning fossil fuels. There are three main technology concepts for CO2 capture, which are known as post-combustion capture, pre-combustion capture, and oxy-fuel combustion capture. These three technology concepts were initially devised for application to fossil fuel power plants, but nowadays they, they also find applications in other energy intensive industries. We will now look at these different capture technologies in more detail. In a typical industrial combustion process, a fuel such as coal, biomass or natural gas undergoes combustion in air with the purpose of generating power and heat. This also generates the waste byproduct of flue gas containing 5 to 15% CO2, depending on the process and the fuel used. The post-combustion CO2 removal step is added to capture the CO2 by separating it from the other flue gas components, which will be largely nitrogen and some residual oxygen. As the name suggests, post-combustion capture is applied to the gases that arise after the combustion of fossil fuels, and it's therefore considered as an end of pipe solution. A number of technology options exist for performing post-combustion capture, with the main ones being solvent-based systems using amine solution, solid solvent looping systems using calcium oxide, and membrane module systems for gas separation. Let's now take a closer look at the inner workings of the solvent-based systems using amine solution. In the amine-based post-combustion capture process step, the flue gas containing 5 to 15% CO2 first flows in a pipe to a CO2 absorption unit vessel, which operates at 40 to 60 degrees Celsius. In this, the flue gas comes um, into contact with a downflowing amine solution with which the CO2 in the flue gas reacts and becomes absorbed into the solution. The CO2 has now been separated from the other flue gas components and the CO2 free gas flows out of the top of the CO2 absorption unit. While the CO2 rich amine solvent sinks out of the bottom of the CO2 absorption unit where it then flows to a CO2 stri stripper unit vessel operating at higher temperatures of between 100 and 150 degrees Celsius. This higher temperature allows the CO2 absorption reaction with the amine to be reversed so that the CO2 comes out of solution and the pure CO2 streams flows out of the top of the stripper unit. CO2 lean solvent sinks out of the stripper unit and flows back to the absorption unit, where it once again comes into contact with the fresh incoming flue gas. The whole process operates as a continuous mode. The second type of technology is pre-combustion capture. The process begins with an air separation process to separate oxygen and nitrogen in air. The oxygen is passed to a gasification system with a, flu with, with a fuel such as coal or biomass. In the gasifier, the fuel is partially oxidized to produce syngas, which contains 20 to 40% carbon dioxide, mixed with other combustible gases, such as carbon monoxide and hydrogen. Next, the gas mixture undergoes the CO2 capture step using physical or chemical solvents, similar to the post-combustion process and may also include a reaction step with steam to produce more CO2 and hydrogen. What is left over after CO2 removal is a gas composed of mostly hydrogen, which can be combusted in air to generate carbon-free power and heat or be used in chemical processes. 
One can see that pre-combustion capture is so cold because carbon dioxide is removed from the fuel before the main combustion step. The use of pre-combustion capture, capture is not as widespread as post-combustion capture because of its high upfront cost, and it can only be applied to certain types of power plants and industrial processes. The third type of technology, oxy-fuel combustion capture, works by also separating oxygen from air in an air separation unit and using it to burn a solid fuel of coal or biomass to generate power and heat. The resulting exhaust gas from the oxy combustion process consists of mainly CO2, along with some water vapor and some contaminants. A portion of these exhaust gas is recycled back to the combustion process in order to lower the otherwise too high combustion temperature that would result from burning fuel in oxygen alone. The final part of the process is a CO2 cleanup step to remove the unwanted contaminants, resulting in a high purity CO2 product stream. After the application of each of the CO2 capture technologies, the, captures, the captured CO2 must be transported to a geological storage site. There are two main options for large scale CO2 transport. The first of these is by onshore or offshore CO2 pipeline which can transport CO2 either in the gas space with a pipeline operating at up to 35 bar and between five and 40 degrees Celsius, or in the dense phase in which a fluid has the viscosity of gas and the density of a liquid. For dense phase transport, CO2 must be compressed to a pressure between 85 and 150 bar and will have a temperature between 12 and 44 degrees Celsius. CO2 shipping is the second large scale mode for offshore transport in the absence of CO2 pipeline infrastructure. CO2 is transported most economically by ship when it is in the liquid phase, having a pressure between 6 and 30 bar and low temperatures between minus 50 and minus 20 degrees Celsius. CO2 is transported from the capture site to a geological storage site. A number of options for high pressure injection into geological storage medium exist. First, CO2 could be stored in depleted oil and gas reservoirs, or could be used for enhanced oil recovery. CO2 could be injected into deep unused saline water saturated reservoir rocks or it could be injected into deep amenable coal seams, or it could be used in enhanced coal bed methane recovery. There are also a few other suggested options, such as the injection of CO2 into basalts, oil shales, or cavities. The use of CO2 to produce more fossil fuels, such as in enhanced oil recovery or enhanced coal bed methane recovery, is somewhat controversial because the net atmospheric CO2 mitigation from the overall CCS process is likely to be lower. This next image gives you a true sense of the scale of the injection depth, which is around 1,837 meters for an offshore geological storage site and around 2,000 meters for an onshore storage. Once the CO2 reaches these depths and comes into contact with the storage reservoir, different CO2 trapping mechanism comes into play. Structural trapping refers to that CO2 that is trapped as a dense fluid or gas under a low permeability cap rope, which acts as a seal. This is the most dominant of the trapping mechanisms. Residual trapping happens very quickly during the CO2 injection process as the porous rock acts like a tight sponge trapping the CO2 in a similar way to what water gets trapped in a household sponge. Solubility trapping occurs when CO2 dissolves in other fluids in its gaseous and dense phase state. This trapping mechanism involves the CO2 dissolving into the salt water or brine already present in porous rocks. Finally, the, minor, the, the mineral trapping results when CO2 dissolves in water to form weak carbonic acid. Over a long period of time, this weak acid can react with the minerals in the surrounding rock to form solid carbonate minerals. <laughs>
This fault trapping mechanism ensures that the CO2 is stored underground over a geological time frame and therefore minimizes the potential of CO2 leakage. Here are some of the challenges that are related to CCS deployment. Technological development must be achieved to arrive at commercial deployment level. Many of these technologies are fairly new have, and have never been before applied to the target sector industries as needed. Large scale infrastructure needs to be designed and built. There are only few carbon capture and storage sites globally and the strategic storage site and infrastructure, including transport, require more internal interconnection. Costs must be reduced. CCS is still an expensive technology compared to the status quo, and there's no significant cost incentives such as carbon pricing. Also, policy support and societal readiness is needed. Policymakers need to create the right environment and incentives to allow for a competitive market, while public opposition needs to be mitigated and avoided through the active consultation and engagement of key stakeholder groups. The CCS industry will offer many employment opportunities for chemical engineers. Since in the UK, it has been estimated that it will create 225,000 jobs up to 2060 and will generate up to 130 billion pounds in economic benefits. The future professions and roles in the CCS industry will be well suited to skills of tomorrow's chemical engineers. Chemical engineers have a really important role to play because they will develop and deploy groundbreaking CCS technology for the least cost mitigation of dangerous climate change. The technology is still under development and therefore we need more bright, young and diverse minds working to develop the technology solutions of the future. So if you're good in maths and chemistry, then we need you. Thank you for listening to this video. If you have questions or would like further information about CCS, then please feel free to contact either myself or Richard by email. If you have questions about studying chemical engineering at UCL, you may contact Isobel McKay.